The webinar today will explore how translational neurobiology research is being conducted in the intramural research program of the NIH in a broad variety of disorders, including depression, age-related macular degeneration, and Gaucher disease. Our panelists all conduct translational research across the full bench to bedside continuum with the ultimate goal of developing novel paradigms for the treatment of a range of diseases and improving quality of life for patients. Today they will share their experiences and how they have applied their basic research in a clinical setting. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the three exceptional scientists joining me today, all from the intramural research program here at the Bethesda, Maryland campus of the NIH. They are Dr. Carlos Zarate from the National Institute of Mental Health, Dr. Ellen Sedransky from the National Human Genome Research Institute, and Dr. Anand Swaroop from the National Eye Institute. Many thanks to you all for being with us today. Thank you, sir. Before we get started, I have some important information for our audience. Please note that you can adjust the size or hide any of the windows in your viewing console. The widgets at the bottom of the console control what you see. Click on these to see the speaker bios, additional information about the NIH Intramural Research Program, or to download a PDF of the slides. Each of our speakers will give a short presentation about their work, after which we will have a Q&A session, during which our panel will address questions submitted previously by email or from our live studio audience. We unfortunately will not be accepting questions from our online viewers today. You can also log into your Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn accounts during the webinar to post updates or send tweets about the event. Just click the relevant widgets at the bottom of the screen. For tweets, you can add the hashtag hash science webinar. Finally, thank you to the NIH Intramural Research Program for sponsoring today's webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Carlos Zarate, who is Chief of the Experimental Therapeutics and Pathophysiology Branch and of the Section on Neurobiology and Treatment of Mood and Anxiety Disorders at the National Institute of Mental Health. His research focuses on the pathophysiology and development of novel therapeutics for treatment-resistant mood disorders, as well as the study of biomarkers and neural correlates for, for treatment response. Welcome, Dr. Zarate. Thank you, Sean, for introducing me and giving me the opportunity to present our work uh, in today's webinar. So the topic today will be depression, specifically focusing on two major points. One, how we go about developing treatments that work in hours instead of six to eight weeks, which our conventional antidepressants take. And the second is, what are those cellular, molecular, and neural correlates of this rapid antidepressant effects in the hope of developing better treatments that work similarly within a very short period of time? But first, let's talk about the impact of depression. Depression is a major mental disorder that is associated with significant impairment and ability to function. Patients experience guilt, anhedonia, lack of pleasure, drive, motivation, and have significant impairment in their ability to work, to function, and carry out their normal duties. And this goes on for weeks, if not longer, for years at a time. It is one of the leading causes of disability worldwide, much more disability than major medical disease such as cardiovascular, cerebrovascular disease. It's estimated that approximately 10% of the American popul population suffers from depression, and there's an increased rate of death uh, even after controlling for risk factors such as suicide and smoking. There, it's estimated that it's not only is there a significant morbidity associated with depression, but significant more de mortality. There are over 30,000 suicides per year in the United States alone. And individuals who experience depression and also have had severe medical illnesses such as cancer describe the, the angst and the suffering that go with depression much worse than those uh, when they experience the cancer. Now, we have over 20 to 30 different antidepressants, and uh, it's fair to say that they uh, do benefit many individuals. But for those more moderate to severe depression, uh, recent studies have found that patients do not uh, benefit as much as previously believed to. It's estimated that if one takes a course of an antidepressant first-line treatment, we refer to as uh, citalopram, for example, only one-third of individuals achieve remission within 10 to 14 weeks. Remission means uh, absence of depressive symptoms or only a few depressive symptoms. It often takes two antidepressant trials or six months for half of the people to have a significant improvement in antidepressant treatment. So in my view, that's unacceptable. We've got to do much better. Other areas of medicine can intervene very rapidly within a matter of hours. 
And so we should also uh, try to do the same in uh, major mental disorders, particularly in depression. Now, one of the limitations has to do with that most of our treatments are monominergic based, have been developed based on serotonin and our epinephrine. On the left side of this panel, we see what are the number of mechanistically distinct drug targets in the 1950s. In yellow and green, we see depression and schizophrenia uh, uh, targets, respectively. And after nearly five decades, we remain about the same number of mechanistically distinct drug targets. Whereas in other areas, such as cardiovascular disease, there has been a significant increase in the number of mechanistically distinct drug targets, which has resulted in a decrease in mortality um, from major cardiovascular diseases. That, only, that, that has to do with novel treatments, but also perhaps exercise and preventive measures whereas we have not developed a, a, a new um, group of medications. And that's not because the industry has not tried, or government or academics, they have tried. It's just that the etiology of our major mental disorders is not really that clear. Towards the right are drugs that we use for bipolar disorder, and in, in, in essence, we have uh, not developed a single agent for bipolar disorder based on an understanding of the molecular underpinnings of the disease. Most of the drugs have been repurposed from epilepsy, anticonvulsants, or from schizophrenia, the antipsychotic drugs. Now, one of the limitations of our current medications is the lag of onset of antidepressant effects, and is highlighted in this figure. Towards the bottom, we can see the uh, natural course of the illness without receiving treatment, particularly in the beginning of the illness. It's about 6 to 12 months. But as we give it an antidepressant in the middle yellow line on the bottom of the graph, we see we shift the time curve uh, a little bit sooner in terms of improvement, where one achieves uh, remission within 10 to 14 weeks, only one-third. That's what I already mentioned. The goal with our next generation of treatments would be in the beginning of major depressive episode, when symptoms begin to start, specific, specifically those with a high risk of relapse, would, we would intervene with a, a next generation antidepressant that produces a response in hours. If we're able to do that, one can see the top uh, line of the figure. Yellow is euthymia stabilized mood. Blue it refers to major depressive episodes. And each one has a toll or produces disruption of personal, family, occupational role. And also there's a considerable risk for suicide. But if we intervene in uh, with a treatment that works rapidly, we will decrease the length and severity of the depressive episodes and will decrease the impact on one's uh, personal social life and increase yellow, the euthymic periods where they stay well, stay well. Now, another area where we can explore besides the monomerinergic based system is the glutamate. Complex system, glutamate is an excitatory amino acid abundant in mammalian CNS. And we can see it, it, it's a rich area to uh, pursue targets. And already we and others have pursued targets on regulating glutamate. It's believed that in mood disorders, major depression, there is a disruption of the glutamate-glutamine cyclin pathway. And we may be able to regulate this with a host of compounds. There's uh, indirect evidence that glutamate is involved in depression. We see regional reductions in brain volumes, such as uh, prefrontal cortex, hippocampus, that translate into reductions of spine densities and the pyramidal neurons that uh, are involved in glutamate function. This figure in the top uh, left illustrates uh, our, 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 a, a summary of the presumed mechanism of our current treatments. We see that serotonin and norepinephrine, when I give an antidepressant and serotonin reuptake inhibitor, you can change intrasynaptic levels of serotonin within minutes. Yet it takes weeks, if not longer, for antidepressant effects to take effect. Why is that? Well, there have to be these intracellular signaling cascade changes, changes in gene expression. And what perhaps ultimately matters is changes in a protein in the brain called BDNF, brain-derived neuro, neuro, brain neurotrophic factor, which is involved in synaptic plasticity. And most of our antidepressants uh, do increase that, that BDNF, but it takes a long uh, time to do so. Whereas with treatments that act more directly closer to uh, BDNF, either at two targets, mammalian target of rapamycin, mTOR, or eukaryotic elongation factor two, are more proximal to what is believed to be involved in BDNF release, would result in a more rapid antidepressant effect. Now, in order to do that, one can target the ionotropic postsynaptic glutamate receptor, NMDA, particularly at the synapse. 
And one drug that does that is ketamine, which is a dissociative anesthetic. It's derived from PCP, and it's referred to as a non-competitive NMDA antagonist. Now, when, NMD, when ketamine binds to the NMDA receptor, particularly at the PCP site, while individuals receive ketamine, they experience psychomimetic or dissociative side effects. They're temporarily disconnected from their body senses. There's a long history of safety with this uh, agent. It's used in emergency rooms for diagnostic treatment procedures, and it's also used as an anesthetic. So we and others uh, uh, came, uh, came up with the hypothesis that if you target NMDA receptor directly with an NMDA antagonist, would you bring up about a rapid antidepressant effect? And the answer is yes. Towards the left, we see a depression skill. Down means greater improvement. Towards the bottom left, we see the time course in minutes. So within two hours, we see rapid antidepressant effects. Towards the right are the, per, the, the percentage of individuals having a 50% improvement, what we refer to as response. We can see in the, the, the right uh, graph the, the bars for our current antidepressants. One, if, if one gives an antidepressant, it takes about 62, 65% response rate in six to eight weeks. We see comparable response rates to ketamine within six hours to one day. So we see rapid, robust, and relatively sustained antidepressant effects with a single infusion of ketamine. This is to highlight uh, towards the left, uh, there are now several trials, but we also found the same in bipolar depression, this rapid onset antidepressant effect within hours, lasted most of the week with one infusion. And towards the right, bottom right, uh, lower right, we see not only are the rapid antidepressant effects, but we see rapid anti-suicidal effects within one hour. And this could have major impact on public health because we could produce rapid antidepressant effects and rapid anti-suicide effects within a very short period of time. Now this, this figure, this cartoon, illustrates that uh, ketamine not only blocks an MDA receptor, but it enhances glutamate release. And we can see uh, that it's believed since NMDA receptors are blocked, that there's in in enhanced throughput through AMPA receptors, which ultimately is involved in BDNF brain neurotrophic factor production. And towards the bottom right, um, work by uh, Yale, Ron Duman, uh, suggests that mTOR, mammalian target, of rapamycin is involved in a rapid and impressive effects of ketamine. One can see within one hour, uh, with, with very rapidly within a few hours, behavioral effects in animals, increased synaptic activity, and within 24 hours, increased spine density. There is synaptogenesis within 24 hours. So there are a number of compounds that are now in development because ketamine produces these dissociative side effects. Some are looking at other targets within the NMDA receptor complex I mentioned. One compound that we tested here at, at NIH uh, is AZD6765. It's a low affinity NMDA trapping blocker. We see towards the left uh, ketamine that has high trapping blockade believed to be involved in a psychomimetic dissociative side effects. And towards the right, we see this compound that's associated. So in theory, one would predict that there are lower, lower dissociative side effects. So in this proof of concept with one single intravenous infusion in people with treatment-resistant depression, we see onset within hours uh, an antidepressant effect as illustrated by the decrease in uh, the, the symptoms, uh, depressive symptoms. And more importantly, it, we didn't find any evidence of dissociative or psychomimetic effects. So this proof of concept study suggests that it's possible to develop rapid antidepressant effects without these dissociative side effects. The second point I mentioned um, in the beginning was we want to be understand drugs or treatments that are radically different than existing treatments. Ketamine, as I mentioned, is one tool, and scopolamine is another agent which is a muscarinic antagonist, produces response within a couple of days. So with a biological systems levels approach using a multitude of technologies to, to do very deep biophenotyping, anywhere from the genes on the left all the way to a rapid reversal of complex behavioral phenotypes such as depression, we can look for intra, um, intermediate phenotypes. And this is a summary of some of the work that's going, uh, taking place. 
Um, at the genetic level, we know that BDNF, a SNP, um, within um, um, the, uh, if, if one has, is, is largely a MET carrier towards the right, we see that uh, you have a lower uh, degree of response to ketamine than if you have valval um, BDNF. Um, this is to show that one of the limitations of psychiatry or, or studying brain is we don't have a window into the brain, and so these are tasks we can, um, uh, non-invasive, such top left, where you can see fearful faces that acti- activates anterior cingulate cortex, and it's a measure of plasticity. The more activity you have, the better the response to ketamine. Here we can see in the, uh, when individuals are exposed to fearful tasks, there's a, a, increment, a, a greater chance of responding to ketamine, and we can see pre-treatment also ACC predicts antidepressant effects to ketamine. On the right is a cognitive task. We see the reciprocal pattern, so some examples of using um, measures to be able to measure response. Yet another is cortical excitability. We can stimulate fingers with a nomadic device, applies pressure. You can, one can see in the bottom right that uh, the sensory cortex is activated. And one gives ketamine, we can see to the top right, which is the power spectra. And in the middle is gamma, which gamma uh, rhythms are important to uh, connect in different brain regions precisely at the same uh, time. And Towards the bottom, towards the to the left, we can see baseline and yellow non-responders and green responders. The greater the gamma activity to this simple sensory task, uh, we can predict response to ketamine, and encircled is the difference. So in the last slide, uh, I'd like to give you a summary that um, of, of the work that's been taking place. On the right, we see we can produce very consistently, reliably, a reversal of a complex behavioral phenotype within a couple of hours, much radically different than existing treatments. Towards the left, we see some very preliminary evidence that genes might uh, be involved in a response. And in the middle, at the center level, increased spine density appears to be important for response to ketamine. That's evidence at the cellular level. And towards the right of that, on a circuit level, because we believe that mood disorders are disturbed or disorders of circuit, uh, circuits and synapses. So we hope that by filling in the gaps of a systems level biological approach, we may be able to come with, up with a better understanding of treatments that are radically different than existing treatments. Still gaps remain, but this is very promising work. To conclude, I think using ketamine scopolamine as tools is a new paradigm of research to develop across a systems biological level evidence of these effective treatments, understand the cellular, molecular, and neurocorrelates that impart this dramatic response very rapidly in anti-suicide effects, and hopefully with that understanding be able to personalize treatment for our patients and to come up with a better understanding of our signatures uh, that are involved in this rapid onset of antidepressant effects. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Zarate. Uh, We're going to move right on to our second speaker today, and that is Dr. Ellen Sedransky. Uh, She is Chief of the Section of Molecular Neurogenetics and a Pediatrician and Clinical Geneticist in the Medical Genetics Branch of the National Human Genome Research Institute. Her work covers clinical and basic research aspects of Gaucher disease and Parkinson's disease, as well as studies of genotype-phenotype correlation and genetic modifiers, clinical insights from mouse models, and the development of new treatment strategies for lysosomal storage disorders. She also focuses on on understanding the complexity encountered in simple Mendelian disorders, the association between Gaucher disease and Parkinsonism, and the development of small molecule chaperones as a therapy for Gaucher disease and related disorders. Welcome, Dr. Sadransky. Thank you very much, Sean. It's my pleasure to be here to tell you about our work that's being conducted here at NIH. Uh, I've chosen to focus on our projects on Gaucher disease and Parkinsonism, which you'll see is an evolving story. What I hope to show you today is how studies of rare recessive disorders can provide a window into more complex disorders, where in our case, By focusing a single, a detailed examination of a single gene disorder, Gaucher disease, we've come up with insights that are applicable first to monogenic disorders, but ultimately might help unravel complex disorders like Parkinson's disease. 
So just to introduce the two disorders that I'm focusing on are really quite different. Gaucher disease is a rare recessive single gene disorder. It's the deficiency of an enzyme leading to the accumulation of a lipid. There's variable age of onset, multi-organ involvement, and symptoms include enlarged livers and spleens, low platelet and blood counts, and at times bone and brain involvement. In contrast, Parkinson disease is a common disorder affecting 1.5% of the population over age 65, and it's a complex multi-gene disorder with a late onset. It results from a loss of dopaminergic neurons in the brain, and we see the accumulation of aggregates of proteins, including one that you'll hear about, alpha-synuclein, within bodies inside the brain that are known as Lewy bodies. The symptoms of Parkinsonism and Parkinson disease include bradykinesia, which is slow movements, rigidity, tremor, and sometimes dementia. And it's a disorder that primarily affects the substantia nigra and brain stem regions. So how are these two disorders associated? I'm going to show you that by using an integrated translational re approach that with pathologic studies, clinical studies, genetic studies, imaging, cell biology, et cetera, we're beginning to gain some insight into this. So to begin with Gaucher disease, um, it's the inherited deficiency of the enzyme glucocerebrosidase, which cleaves a glucose moiety off of the lipid glucocerebroside. It's the most common lysosomal storage disorder and the most common inherited disorder among Ashkenazi Jews. It's a disorder primarily of the reticuloendothelial system where lysosomes within macrophages become engorged with the storage, stored lipid, giving rise to what you see on the left, the characteristic appearing Gaucher cell. And on the right, you're looking at an electron micrograph of a Gaucher cell and the distorted um, organelle that you see there is actually a lysosome which is engorged with this tubular storage material. There's vast clinical heterogeneity encountered in this single gene disorder. It's classically divided into three types, type 1 being non-neurologic, type 2 being acute neuronopathic, and type 3 being chronic neuronopathic. But having studied patients with this disorder for more than two decades now, I really come to see it much more as a spectrum ranging from asymptomatic octogenarians to fetuses that succumb in utero with wide range of associated manifestations. And one of the groups that we started to appreciate um, was patients that develop Parkinsonian manifestations. So this association between what I'll call GBA or the gene for glucocerebrositis and Parkinsonism was a story that really began here at the NIH Clinical Center with the observation of actually one particular patient who we were seeing for Gaucher disease who had um, pretty progressive Parkinsonism. We then noted that this, these two phenotypes did were encountered sometimes in other rare patients. And then we also started to appreciate that Parkinson disease was seen in relatives of our patients with Gaucher disease more often than we might expect. Then we and other groups around the world started to appreciate that there was an increased incidence of GBA mutations in patients with Parkinson disease and with associated Lewy body disorders. However, actually, many of these initial studies were greeted with skepticism because of limitations of power and controls, and also because large genome-wide association studies had not identified this gene. But the associations persist, and now glucocerebrosidase is considered the most common genetic risk factor for Parkinson's disease. In fact, if you just look in the last decade doing PubMed scans, the m number of papers and studies on this gene related to Parkinson's disease is growing exponentially. Though I do want to f emphasize that the vast majority of the patients that we see with Gaucher disease and the majority of Gaucher carriers or people with mu GBA mutations never develop Parkinson's disease. So it's a risk factor, but not a pre predictive gene. Well, one of the uh, reasons why this began to become more accepted was several years ago, we spearheaded a multi-center uh, study of um, glucocerebrosidase mutations in large groups of patients with Parkinson's disease. 
We collected genotypes from 16 centers spanning four continents and um, ultimately had over 5,000 genotypes from patients with Parkinson's disease and about the same number from controls. The bottom line was we determined that subjects with Parkinson's disease are over five times more likely to have a mutation in glucocerebrosidase, giving an odds ratio of over 5.4. We also noted that patients with Parkinson's disease that carried mutations tended to have a little bit earlier Parkinson onset, about four or five years, and uh, we had the impression that there were more cognitive deficits. Just recently, we've actually gone back and done a very similar um, analysis with uh, 11 different centers participating, where we looked for the frequency of glucocerebrosidase mutations in patients with an associated disorder, dementia with Lewy bodies, here, there's a much more rapid progression of um, cognitive impairment, and it's a rarer disorder. So in this series, we collected about 700 cases. And actually, the odds ratio was greater than 8, suggesting that mutations in this gene play an even larger role in the dimensions with Lewy bodies. At the clinical center, we've been following these patients for about a decade now, and um, our studies focus both on clinical features and PET imaging. Um, we collaborate with Karen Berman's group in the National Institute of Mental Health. The goals of the study are to, to look at fluoridopa uptake and to evaluate PET as a surrogate mark, marker in patients that, in subjects that have glucocerebrosidase mutations and to see if we can find the earliest signs of Parkinson's disease in this at-risk cohort. So in our studies, we recruit patients that have both Gaucher disease and Parkinson's disease. We're also looking at Gaucher patients and Gaucher carriers who have a positive family history of Parkinsonism. Patients come to the NIH and undergo a fairly routine physical, neurologic, and neurocognitive evaluation each time. We do um, olfactory testing and screens for non-motor symptoms of Parkinsonism to see if we can find some signs of early involvement. The imaging studies include um, MRI, fluoridopa PET studies for, for, fluorid, for dopa metabolism. We do radioactive water studies to evaluate cerebral blood flow, and we're evaluating transcranial sonography. Uh, we just recently published the results in our first 40 patients that we've studied. And basically, we, we found that patients with Parkinsonism that also had Gaucher disease had fluoridopa uptake that was very similar to patients that just had sporadic Parkinson disease. Where we did see differences were in the cerebral blood flow studies, where we see some changes that are more characteristic of disorders with cognitive impairment. And this study is ongoing. So how can mutations in a metabolic enzyme lead to Parkinson's disease? Well, the verdict is not out, but there are certain hypotheses to consider. One is that the, we know that the formation of insoluble alpha-synuclein aggregates contribute to the neuronal cell death that occurs in Parkinsonism. So the gain-of-function hypothesis is that having this mutant enzyme around could somehow lead to an increase of an aggregate formation, as you see on the right, or it could lead to organelle dysfunction, particularly the lysosome, leading to decreased aggregate clearance, both cases contributing to these aggregates that lead, contribute to neuronal cell death. But another hypothesis would be that this is a loss of function, that having the mutant glucocerebrosidase around leads to an unstable or deficient protein that's degraded, and then you don't have enough enzyme, so the lipid accumulates, and the accumulation of this lipid could lead to neuronal cell death. And then another theory that was uh, recently published by our group in collaboration with the group at Mass General is that there could be, it could be even more involved, there could be something like a, what we call the bidirectional feedback loop, where there's indications that having increases in this lipid level of gluc glucosal ceramide lead to increased in soluble alpha-synuclein oligomers and fibrils, and having these around would contribute to alpha-synuclein aggregates in neuronal cell death. At the same time, having these insoluble aggregates around seems to block the ER Golgi trafficking of the enzyme, which again would um, lead to increased lipid accumulation and it compounding the problem in a, in a vicious cycle. 
In collaboration with Jennifer Lee's group and NHLBI, we've also done some biophysics studies, and we, seem to, we feel that there is likely a molecular link between alpha-synuclein and our enzyme glucocerebrosidase. This was shown by several different techniques, including fluorescent spectroscopy, NMR, and co-immunoprecipitation studies. Though the association only appears to be um, <laughs> It only appears to occur at pH 5.5 and not pH 7. The interaction between the two proteins appears to occur at the C terminus of alpha-synuclein. So this binding uh, at lysosomal pH could facilitate alpha-synuclein degradation or prevent aggregation. Also, this GBA story implicates the lysosome in PD pathogenesis. Now I'm going to move on a little bit towards what some of the work that we've been doing in therapeutics. And one approach that we've been looking at as a therapy for Gaucher disease is chemical chaperone therapy. The protein glucocerebrosidase is um, synthesized in the ER and it, it's glycosylated and folded, and, but it doesn't reach its um, tertiary functional structure until it's actually in the lysosome, as you see the top panel on the right. If you have a mutation in the enzyme, it's likely that it will not fold correctly and it will be degraded and none of it will get to the lysosome. So our strategy is to come up with small chemi chemicals that are known as chemical chaperones that can bind to the mutant um, protein, stabilize it and, uh, so that it's at least partially corrected and it can get to the uh, lysosome where it can still function. So in collaboration with the national, uh, the NCGC, the National Chemical Genomic Screening Center, we've been conducting high throughput screening of large um, libraries of small molecules to see what might impact the enzyme activity in glucocerebrosidase. And in fact, recently we took a new approach and we actually used a patient spleen sample as our source of mutant enzyme. In this high throughput screen, we evaluated 250,000 compounds at seven different concentrations. Fortunately, there's robots to do this work, and um, identified 30 new non inhibitor chaperones that we're very excited about. Our lead chaperones look like they can improve the translocation of the enzyme to the lysosome and patient fibroblasts. And in macrophages, I'm going to show you, the compound seems to reverse storage. So the small molecule therapies like this may stabilize mutant glucocerebrosidase and also be used to treat Gaucher disease as well as possibly Parkinson's disease. Well, one problem that we had with this drug development is that we didn't have a really good um, model for showing reversal of storage, which is what you target in Gaucher disease. So in the last few years, we've been working to develop induced pluripotent stem cells as a model for Gaucher disease, beginning with pa patient fibroblasts. We genera generated the appropriate embryoid bodies and then showed that, that our cells have, make the appropriate markers, have the right karyotype, they can go on to form teratomas. We differentiated them first into monocytes and then macrophages. And to our excitement, we were able to determine that Gaucher macrophages can show the storage, which we were never able to demonstrate before. We think this model will be very useful for drug development and for understanding pathophysiology. And to demonstrate this, so what we do, at, um, we, if you see the two uh, fluorescent images below, one is of a control, uh, or control macrophages uh, generated from induced pluripotent stem cells, and on the right is a Gaucher when you feed these cells with labeled erythrocyte ghosts, you can appreciate that only the, the fluorescent storage is much, much greater in the Gaucher um, macrophages. Then we take these macrophages and we treat them with our um, best chaperones. Mm -hmm. So the top panel is the control and the second two panels, the two lower panels are um, macrophages from patients. When in the very last column to the right, we've added our um, lead chaperone, and you can see that we're seeing a reversal of the storage, um, indicating that this does seem to have promise. So I hope that I've shown you that understanding the links between these two disorders uh, can prove to be quite fruitful, teaching us 
about the pathogenesis of both disorders, providing some clues into the role of lysosomes in the development of Parkinsonism, and that ultimately it may yield improved genetic counseling and new therapeutic strategies. And I just want to briefly acknowledge all the people in my group who've done this work, my close collaborators here at NIH and around the world, and of course to give special thanks to patients, family members, and the referring physicians who have contributed to these studies. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Sidransky. Um, we're going to move on to our final speaker for this webinar, and that is Dr. Anand Swaroop. He's chief of the Neurobiology, Neurodegeneration, and Repair Laboratory at the National Eye Institute. His laboratory primarily focuses on photoreceptor development and retinal macular degeneration diseases, including elucidation of transcriptional regulatory pathways involved in cell fate and homeostasis, the genetic basis of retinal defects, and the, the, and the development of treatments using cell gene or small molecule-based approaches. Welcome, Dr. Swaroop. Thank you, Sean, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, blindness generally ranks uh, second or third among all the fear or scary diseases in this world. In many, many surveys after cancer or cardiovascular diseases, people are very scared of going blind. What I'm going to tell you today is some of the research that we are doing on transcriptional regulatory networks uh, to produce a photoreceptor cell that captures light and also going to tell you how some of this research is leading to new paradigms for finding treatment for retinal and macular degeneration. Retina, in fact, is our window to this visual world and also to brain. Uh, Dr. Zalate earlier said uh, we have no window to the brain. Actually, retina is. It's most approachable part of the central nervous system. At any point in time and space, you can look at thousands, in fact, over 100,000 individuals of different size, shapes, color. You can look at their location in a visual field. You can see them moving around. And despite all these objects, you are able to focus on a single individual if you chose to. All of this visual information is processed through cells in the back of our eye called retina. In fact, uh, light uh, is uh, focused through various optical elements called cornea and lens that many of you are aware of. And that focused light goes to retina, which is, uh, is, is relatively simple but architecturally a beautiful stratified part of central nervous system. There are six major types of neurons as shown on the right side of this slide. These neurons are organized in three layers of cells. The layer which is at the bottom actually is an epithelial layer called retinal pigment epithelium or RPE which is extremely important for supporting the cells next to those uh, that and this is retina, uh, these are photoreceptors and I'm going to talk to you more about the photoreceptors a little later. The information that is captured by photoreceptors goes through bunch of different kinds of neurons in uh, 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 different types of interneurons and then these neurons uh, convey information to ganglion cells and axons of these ganglion cells from optic nerve and that takes information to different parts of brain. All of this information actually is captured, integrated, processed uh, to certain extent at least in the retina. In fact, 30 percent of our brain is devoted to processing of visual information. As one can imagine, uh, degeneration of these cells, which are post-mitotic, will lead to blindness. Even though we have treatment for certain kind of blinding disorders, like cataract and to certain extent glaucoma, retinal and macular degeneration are still a major cause of untreated uh, untreatable blindness. They're highly heterogeneous, both clinically and genetically. Uh, if you look at the left, or rather right, uh, the top part shows you the picture of a fundus. If you look in the eye of an individual, this is what you will see. Uh, beautifully, nicely colored, uh, uniformly colored part. Uh, you can see optic uh, disc, which, has got, uh, which is where optic nerve goes through, and then optic vessels come in the retina. The center of this retina is fovea, that's where highest visual acuity is. 
and that's where the light actually gets focused. The area around fovea is called macula and degeneration of photoreceptors and underlying pigment epithelium cells will lead to macular degeneration and as you can see in the picture below, a degeneration of photoreceptors in the macular region will lead to loss of central vision and you will not be able to see or drive or watch TV. Whereas on the right side of that you have another picture of the fundus where there is degeneration of photoreceptors in the peripheral retina and that leads to loss of peripheral vision even though your central vision is okay you will not be able to see in, on, uh, on the periphery. The many many different genes that can lead to retinal and macular diseases as written here over 200 genes have been mapped and more, more than 150 have already been identified. Many genes can lead to same phenotype and sometimes the same gene and even the same mutation in a family can lead to distinct phenotypes for a variety of reasons. Retinal degeneration is also observed as part of numerous syndromic diseases and uh, in fact we have been working on many, uh, there are many diseases like nephronesthesis and others where you have kidney disorders or other neurological disorders along with retinal degeneration and then you have multifactorial disease like age-related macular degeneration. So in majority of these diseases, dysfunction of death of photoreceptors leads to loss of vision. There are two kinds of photoreceptors, rods which allow you to see in the night and cones which are actually much less in number. In humans, it's only 5% of all photoreceptors but they allow you to see in bright light, they are responsible for high resolution and also color vision. And color vision is mediated by different kinds of cone receptors because they include different visual pigments. Short wavelength for like S cones, M cones have medium wavelength uh, visual pigment and long wavelength are L cones in human. In mice you have only two kinds of cones, S cones and M cones. Photoreceptors are highly active, metabolically active cells and the reason is that these highly polarized cells have got these membrane discs as you can see on top of these photoreceptors. 10% of these discs are shed every day. That means the whole outer segment is regenerated every year, rather every 10 days. And even though these cells are post-mitotic and they do not uh, regenerate, the outer segment part which is where the light is captured has to be replaced every 10 days. And these outer segment discs are like membrane discs which contain phototransduction material. Now my lab over the last 20 plus years has focused on all aspects of photoreceptor biology. We look at photoreceptor differentiation, look at aging of photoreceptors, many many different diseases that are caused by defects in photoreceptor function and then eventually trying to look at the treatment for these photoreceptor diseases. Today, however, I will briefly focus in this sh short duration on uh, networks that are involved in differentiation of photoreceptors and how we are trying to identify treatments. Photoreceptors and in fact all retinal neurons and glia are generated from common pools of cells and as on the left you can see rod photoreceptors which dominate the retina, there are over 70% of all cells in the retina, their birth overlaps with the birth of all other cells. There is a conserved order of birth and as you can see on the right, uh, this uh, photoreceptor differentiation like other differentiation of different uh, cell types proceeds in a very uh, sort of uh, simple manner. You have uh, dividing multipotent progenitor cells at some point in their differentiation they become lineage restricted then when they exit cell cycle they have their fate specified and then through a variety of uh, regulatory pathways these photoreceptors acquire function. Multiple transcription factors are involved in generating uh, in this pathway however let us focus towards the right only on transcription factors that are involved in photoreceptor self determination. The primary factor there is NRL. Along with that you have a bunch of other factors, CRX, which is a homeodomain transcription factor, very critical for both rod and cone photoreceptors. TR beta 2 is primarily for cone differentiation and NR2E3. 
several years ago, an excellent postdoc in my lab, Alan Mears, made a knockout for this NRL gene and showed that if you uh, knock out this gene, a loss of function of this specific gene uh, leads to a cone-only retina. You have no longer any type of rods. Uh, there's, there's this complete fate switch. At the bottom of the slide, you could see uh, the ERG or electroretinogram that shows the functional characteristics of these photoreceptors. In wild type, you can see the dark adapted ERG is very high, but in knockout, it's flat. Dark adapted ERG uh, shows the response of rods. Light, ad light adapted is for cone cells, and you could see there is a huge increase in cone response uh, in this NRL knockout retina. And what is even more exciting for us was when this graduate student at, oh, what he did was he uh, took NRL and expressed it under the control of CRX promoter, which is both in rods and cones, and showed that now all cones become uh, rods. So NRL alone is sufficient uh, to convert cone photoreceptors to rod photoreceptors. And in fact, if you drive NRL expression under the control of s uh, promoter, which is when the cone cells are actually even uh, at a different stage in differentiation, even then some of these differentiating cone photoreceptors can get converted to rods, as much as 40% of these cells. Uh, something which is even more exciting for us working with Douglas Forrest here at NIDDK, we showed that TR beta 2 and NRL, these two transcription factors are present in certain photoreceptor precursors at the same time. As I mentioned earlier, TR beta 2 is responsible for M cone differentiation, whereas NRL is for rod differentiation. What are they doing in the same cell? What we believe is happening is that there is some sort of tug of war going on between different transcription factors, and they can then sort of determine what they're going to be. And this particular uh, slide shows us the transcription regulatory network. I'm not going to go into the detail of that, but what it shows is that the default pathway is the S cone pathway. And if you have NRL, you're going to make a rod photoreceptor. If you have no NRL, you're going to go uh, towards the S cone. Or if TR beta 2 is there, you're going to make an M cone. Now, another postdoc in the lab showed that if you can take the NRL promoter and drive GFP, you could label the photo, rod photoreceptors as soon as they are born. This is uh, extremely important because now we can flow sort these cells and these flow sorted photoreceptor cells can be utilized to develop gene regulatory networks during differentiation and under, in disease processes. You could use these uh, purified photoreceptor for cell replacement and for drug discovery. Now, what we have been doing in this brief slide, I'm going to give you a whole lot of background, or a whole lot of uh, information. What we have been doing is we have been trying to look at the networks that guide the differentiation of newborn photoreceptors to a functional photoreceptors by doing RNA-seq and other profiling, global profiling. We are doing CHIP-seq uh, with uh, using different transcription factors, histone modification studies, and DNA methylation. And I've listed the names of postdocs and fellows who have been involved in this particular work. Now. Several years ago, we collaborated with a group in London and showed that we could take these photoreceptor precursors, the newborn uh, uh, NRL-positive photoreceptors, and we can transplant in degenerating retina. And these cells will then uh, not only differentiate, but also integrate within the retina and could give you some function. But you need to have these immature developing rods once the cells differentiate, that means fully differentiate, they have outer segments, they can no longer function or integrate within this degenerating retina. This has been very exciting uh, development. A large number of labs have now been trying to uh, use this technology to uh, approach stem cell-based therapy for retinal repair. Here is another slide working with David Zacks. We showed that you could put that in a degenerating retina and these cells can integrate and as shown here. And they are viable for several months. Kohei Homa in the lab has recently 
uh, uh, have got a paper now in press which showed that this NRL GFP positive developing rod photoreceptors, when you integrate them in a degenerative retina, they are functional and their function is very similar. Their membrane properties by using patch clamp and other uh, studies are very similar to native rods. Now, how do you make these rod photoreceptors if you want to do transplantation therapy? You could do that from human embryonic stem cells, IPS or induced pluripotent stem cells, and you could develop these immature photoreceptors for a variety of different uh, uses at a later stage. Now, this is just one of the slides that I wanted to put in here. Uh, pioneering work in the lab of Dr. Sasai in Japan showed last year, or in 2011 actually, uh, that you could make uh, eye in a dish from uh, both mouse and later on he showed it from human ear cells. And this, we have been uh, using their protocols to develop uh, human retina in a dish and uh, Rasukan and Kohei and Jessica in the lab have been working on these strategies to look at uh, rather to, to generate neural retina. Now, what we have also discovered very recently is that the, the retinal photoreceptors, if you make them in a dish, do not have outer segments and they will not respond to light. For that, you require retinal pigment epithelium integrity, and this was another work that we have uh, uh, published very recently in development where we show uh, uh, RP is critical for only outer segment morphogenesis. Sulfate is st still conserved, but outer segments are not there if RPE is not uh, properly polarized. So what do we need to have cell-based replacement therapies for retinal and macular degeneration? We need to generate photoreceptors, but uh, we, can, uh, we can make these cells, but we still need to do a little bit more work on epigenetics and other characteristics of these cells. We should also be able to purify these cells without using GFP. Uh, otherwise, it will be hard for us to transplant these in uh, uh, humans. Uh, transplanting methods have become uh, pretty good these days, but we need to find ways so that the cells do not clump and we might require some sort of biomaterial or a scaffold. Cell integration is still relatively poor. Only small number of cells get integrated in the retina. We need to figure out ways to improve that. We also need to uh, find fundamental methods to, to generate their connections. And um, uh, we are also working on many different methods for better assessment for efficacy in animal models. Eventually, we believe that we need to have some sort of 3D reconstruction of outer ret retina if we want to uh, have treatment for retinal and macular degenerative diseases. I'm going to stop there. This is our group. A large number of people have been involved in this work. Along with that, we have several collaborators. I'm going to stop with this quote from Helen Keller. The only thing worse than being blind is having sight, but no vision. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Swaroop. And um, many thanks to all of our speakers for their excellent presentations. Uh, we're going to move right on to the Q&A portion of the webinar now. Uh, we have uh, probably about 10 minutes, so I'm going to get through as many questions as we can. Um, so the first question I'm going to put to all of you, and maybe we'll start with Dr. Swaroop and we'll work our way back down the table, um, is um, how might some of the processes and techniques that you're developing right now uh, in your research be applicable to some other fields of biomedicine? So just very, three very quick points. As I mentioned earlier, retina is part of brain. And, uh, in fact, retinal disease research has been at the forefront, uh, at the poster child for human genome uh, project. Uh, first uh, disease that was mapped by using uh, GVAS was age-related macular degeneration. Gene therapy has been highly successful in case of uh, you know, um, this retinal degeneration caused by defects in RP65 gene. And so what we are hoping is that some of the work that we are trying to do in, in discovering transcriptional ne uh, regulatory network, uh, some of these will also be uh, uh, sort of will, will be directly applicable to uh, research on other neurodegenerative diseases, specifically Alzheimer's and Parkinson. Yes, I, 
I think that as we're trying to understand the genetic basis of many different disorders, work, beginning with work on Mendelian disorders can give us sort of an anchor, whereas when, if we can try to understand how we get this great d spectrum of variability in a single gene disorder, looking at modifiers or other um, contributing factors, it'll be helpful when we go to tackle complex disorders that have multi-genes involved. And I also think that some of the uh, strategies and techniques that we're looking for um, also will have wide ap ap applicability. First of all, things like the IPS models and also um, whole s what, um, high throughput screens for, for small molecule targets. Right. Dr. Durante? In, uh, with regards to understanding more about uh, the circuits or synapses, we, we find that uh, there's a lot of comorbidity with uh, certain of our disorders. Uh, within other psychiatric disorders, one might see more substance abuse, one might see more uh, comor comorbid medical conditions, neurological conditions, and, 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 and it's that these uh, dysfunction at the synapse may apply not only to mood disorders, but might apply to PTSD, may apply to other disorders. And, and the more we understand the, how we stabilize the synaptic dysfunction, at the synapse level and also at the circuit level might be applicable to other disorders. Some of our medications, for example, lithium is neuroprotective and mm -hmm. is being studied in, uh, in um, Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disease, and it's also been studied in, in eye conditions where as a model for infarction. So we can see that some of our drugs are being applied to other disorders, and particularly it's the neuroprotective properties. So it Question, I'm, I'm going to stay with you, Dr. Zoraita, that I think is uh, very interesting and hopefully not too controversial, is um, have you encountered any barriers or biases in your research amongst uh, colleagues or other, pe other people in the, in the same area um, who might not appreciate the molecular underpinnings of mood disorders? Well, I, I think that one of the limitations we have in, in, in psychiatry is that we don't have a clear uh, ideology and there's certain um, assumptions on what might be the causes. The, the issue is that the lack of, uh, of, uh, of uh, targets um, has been a, a hindrance in terms of drug development for psychiatric disorders. And when we go from target to hit, target to lead, um, we're assuming this based on some obscure notion of how our disorders work, mental diseases. And the, the, the other um, aspect of that is uh, uh, we were, most of our research was based on animal models, uh, which were uh, largely developed uh, to identify compounds that modulate serotonin, norepinephrine, monoaminergic systems. And that's led to development of uh, Me Too drugs over the years. And so now that there is a move to kind of more social affective models, uh, animal models, mm -hmm. um, other ways of um, assessing, um, you know, um, uh, develop a more sophisticated models than we previously had. And the other is a w to work backwards. I mean, if we find uh, treatments are radically different, then we can become to understand, um, you know, what, what might be the circuit synapses or uh, genes involved. Uh, and that might not, that perhaps will lead to an understanding of the pathophysiology of the illness, but if, if not, then at least we might be able to develop better treatment. So I think there's a considerable progress in recent years. It's quite exciting. And um, in, uh, where industry has been moving out of psychiatry now, there seems to be a greater interest of going back, particularly in the area of mood disorders. Hey, Dr. Zdransky, I've got a, a question for you. Um, what kind of therapy for Parkinson's do you predict from your research on Gaucher? Well, I think that our research is helping us focus, uh, appreciate the role of uh, lysosomal pathways in um, the etiology of, of Parkinsonism. I also think that there's now more and more evidence in the last few years that ways of, that because of this association between glucoserebrosidase and, and alpha-synuclein, that if we can find ways to enhance glucoserebrosidase, it may um, ameliorate the aggregation that you see with alpha-synuclein. So mm -hmm. strategies like the chaperone the therapy or other ways to increase enzymatic activity in the brain may have a role in Parkinson. Of course, we have a long way to go, and unfortunately, we still don't totally understand the mechanisms, and I think that a lot of basic science work is needed before we can extrapolate totally. 
Uh, Dr. Swaroop, uh, what do you think is currently the biggest, uh, what do you think is the biggest breakthrough that will be needed um, to occur before we, be, we are capable of growing complex organs for replacement such as eyes or possibly brains? Yeah, I, th I think we still do not understand the basic physiology of each of these uh, cells and how they behave in vivo. Uh, we, we look at cell, we look at biochemistry or we do the, the biology mm -hmm. in isolated cell cultures and many times it does not reflect the biology in vivo. So what we have been trying to do is to develop sort of systems in vitro uh, like uh, we could do explant cultures of the retina. We, we have been thinking uh, to, to, to sort of combine biomaterials and nanotechnology-based methods with the cell culture uh, protocols in order to sort of generate these tissues in vitro um, 3D, in 3D so that they can then be used to study biology first. Mm -hmm. And what we are lacking is really a... Uh, collaboration among different scientists, unfortunately, and I, I, you know, I came from extramural uh, site uh, until very recently. I was at the University of Michigan, and in extramural uh, science, we are always concerned about an R01 grant, our own funds, how to do research. But what we are not able to do many times is come together as a group and write large projects, and and many times. Uh, those large projects are thought to be, oh, you know, uh, it's impossible to do this. Fortunately, NIH has taken note of that, and now we are having larger uh, projects or program projects that we are thinking about. NEI has recently started this audacious goals project and trying to sort of bring in people from many, many different areas together uh, in order to, to really solve a problem. And I think that's what we need. We need for people to come together mm -hmm. uh, from different areas in physics and engineering to biology and, and sort of do, uh, w do work together to solve a problem and not focus on a very tiny part of the big picture. We should look at the big picture. Right. right. Any other comments? Dr. Sudransky, Dr. Zarate? Any thoughts I think on building organs? <laughs> one of the strengths that we have here at mm -hmm. NIH is the ability to collaborate with so many people in so many mm -hmm. different fields and I think it's greatly helped and all of our individual work. And it's also given us uh, an opportunity now that there's initiatives to collaborate with extramural and have these joint partnerships with the clinical center so I think that's uh, that's going going to go a long way in uh, facilitating discovery. Mm -hmm. and so, just one comment that mm -hmm. that was the primary reason for me to come here. Mm -hmm. I mean NIH is a wonderful place. I mean I if I don't know anything, I can go around to, to different institutes even and different people. I collaborate with folks in seven different institutes already. And, and there are top-notch scientists here. Sometimes that's not easy to do in extramural. Mm -hmm. and that's where NIH is a great place to come. Mm -hmm. So talking of, of interacting with other people in different fields, uh, we have a question on the role, the potential role that epigenetics might play in neurodegenerative diseases. and how these therapies, um, how, how therapies can maybe hope to uh, overcome such epigenetic alterations. Uh, Dr. Zarate? I'll let the others uh, address okay. that <laughs> Who'd like to go with that, Dr. Swaroop? I mean, epigenetic right now is in, still in very early stage, mm -hmm. and what we are trying to do is understand what it really means in many cases. So right now what we are looking at is that we can manipulate the histone methylations or DNA methylation, and we can change patterns of gene profile. But we don't still have much control over that phenomena of epigenetics. So I think it'll be a few more years uh, from phenomenology that we move to, to really uh, real benefits of understanding epigenetics. So I think we'll take another few years mm -hmm. to, to understand how epigenetic changes are really giving you a specific phenotype and how you can alter or manipulate that to give you a very distinct treatment or a different phenotypes. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sudransky, any thoughts? No, I agree. I think we're now well poised to um, look at the contribution of specific genes to phenotypes. And as we start to appreciate the limitations of this, I think that'll give us openings and probing for other epigenetic mm -hmm. um, compo com components of these disorders. Mm -hmm. And I must admit, at least in the, uh, the mental illness, is going to be much more challenging 
I mean, there are interesting findings of uh, already that uh, uh, how you're reared might affect or, or aspects of abuse and trauma might reflect later in greater suicide rates, mm -hmm. for, exa per, for example, in bipolar disorder, but that's uh, understanding that epigenetics is, is really uh, early on. Great. And you need to do epigenetics uh, in the specific cell type. You cannot use the whole tissue for that mm -hmm. because there'll be multiple different, uh, there are a lot of differences among different cell types. And for many diseases, particularly in psychiatric and neurological diseases, it's hard to get those cells. And if you have them cells in culture, the epigenetic landscape is going to be very different than in vivo. And again, I'm, I'm going to say retina hopefully will provide some of the early uh, sort of conclusions for that kind of right. studies. So uh, we're, we're pretty much out of time, so I'm going to just fire one more question at you. We'll start with, with Dr. Zarate. What do you see as the biggest challenge in moving proof of concept basic research into the clinic, and how can this process possibly be improved? I know the NIH is very focused on this right now. Yes, and I, and I think that there's uh, initiatives, at least by our institute and IMH, uh, and also by NCATS, wonderful initiatives, where uh, most of the trials that were taking place uh, uh, have been, um, were either industry run for many years, and of course, um, a lot of times, uh, there are refinements over existing treatments, which I mentioned. It's not that industry, academia, and government has not tried in um, coming up with new targets and testing them through. But uh, we, we can see that uh, the, the process of drug discovery and development is quite costly. It takes a long time. And at least in mental health or, or CNS disorders, the, the targets are unclear. And so in the models, as we talked, are imperfect. But I think there's a renewed excitement, enthusiasm now, where one can, um, in places like the clinical center, do very specific hypothesis-driven questions uh, where, you know, with, with uh, drug target X or Y, if we go after this, would that lead into an improvement um, in symptoms? And one exam several examples I talked about today. And I think that's possible here. A lot of times these studies are done um, um, in patients taking many medications with comorbidity, and it's unclear if you find something. Not only that, this, uh, the clinical center does uh, permit a heavy uh, uh, um, biophenotype and integrated translation using multimodalities to really not only to test certain hypotheses but hypotheses generated and, and this is a wonderful place you can find a lot of questions that you can pursue and that can be rapidly we can do collaborations with our colleagues here you know going in the eye or or at the metabolic level and so th this is a very wonderful place to to do that and I think um, Part of, I view, our mission intramural is to uh, come up with a signal, uh, mm -hmm. some kind of spark through our work, which is very difficult to do outside. But once you have that spark, you can ignite, you know, discovery and development out there. And I think this place does it very wonderfully. Yeah. Dr. Zaransky? I concur. I think there's certain things that are very special about the clinical center that help us with translational research. One, it's, it's the opportunity to become really expert at one thing and to also do natural history protocols where we longitudinally follow patients and, and really get to understand the disease. And through that, we can find um, targets or, or biomarkers that can be used when we eventually have therapeutics. Mm -hmm. I also am very excited about the the new NCAT Institute and the the concept of programs like the TREND program, which will enable us to um, develop uh, some of the, the new drugs and targets that we, we're working on directly th through people here. Um, and I also want to emphasize the Clinical Center gives us an opportunity to, to do a, um, therapeutic trials so that you can really actually go from the bench to the bed to the bedside and then learn something, go back to the bench, and it really facilitates this evolution. Dr. Mm Farouk? -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, we have come a long way. I, I think basic research still has to be uh, forming the trigger or forming the basis of all the translational studies that we do. And... Uh, translate studies are very expensive, and therefore, as it was pointed out earlier by Dr. Zarate, we need to have a good collaboration with industry, uh, whether it's a, a small biotech or, or large pharma, 
uh, there are certain things we cannot do in academics uh, uh, institutions, whether it's a university or even at NIH. However, NIH uh, offers a very uh, unique environment here that you have people from various areas who can come together. I, I do hope that that's, those sort of opportunities are, are, are available at other institutions as well. Sometimes the money comes into mm -hmm. uh, play, and, and we can't do that. But I do hope that other universities and institutions take note of that and try to create the right environment where basic scientists can work very closely with clinicians and, and also with folks in industry. I mean, I was in a clinical department, and I can tell you uh, in Michigan, uh, both in ophthalmology and then in genetics, uh, many times everyone is so busy mm -hmm. in whatever they do, it's very hard for them to find time to collaborate with each other, even within a department. And, and I think it's up to the institutions to create that. In NIH, we don't have that sort of problem as much. We mm -hmm. can go to our colleagues, and uh, it's much, much easier to do. And I, I do hope that NIH uh, becomes a trigger or, 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 or helps in uh, creating that kind of mm -hmm. environment. Uh, mm -hmm. for people to come together. Fantastic. Well, a lot to discuss, but uh, unfortunately we are out of time for this webinar. Uh, so on behalf of myself and our viewing audience, I wanted to uh, thank our speakers for being with us today. Dr. Carla Serrate from the National Institute of Mental Health, Dr. Ellen Sadransky from the National Human Genome Research Institute, and Dr. Anand Swaroop from the National Eye Institute. Uh, please go to the URL now at the bottom of your slide viewer to learn more about exciting research being carried out within the NIH Intramural Research Program and look out for more webinars from science available at webinar.sciencemag.org. This webinar will be made available to view again as an on-demand presentation within approximately 24 to 48 hours from now. We'd love to hear what you thought of the webinar. Send us an email at the address now up in your slide viewer, webinar at AAAS.org. Again, thank you to our panel and to the Intramural Research Program uh, at the NIH for their kind sponsorship of today's educational seminar. Goodbye.